The gentlewoman from New York, Ms. Ocasio-Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. It's good to see you, Mr. Zuckerberg. I think you, of all people, can appreciate using a person's past behavior in order to determine, predict, or make decisions about future behavior. And in order for us to make decisions about Libra, I think we need to kind of dig into your past behavior and Facebook's past behavior with respect to our democracy. Uh, Mr. Zuckerberg, what year and month did you personally first become aware of Cambridge Analytica? Mm -hmm. When did Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg become aware of Cambridge Analytica? I, I don't know off the top of my you head. You don't know. Um, did anyone on your leadership team know about Cambridge Analytica prior to the initial report by The Guardian on December 11th, 2015? And no, I, I'm actually, as you're asking this, I, I, I do think I, I was aware of Cambridge Analytica as an entity earlier. Mm -hmm. I just, I, I don't know if I was tracking how they were using Facebook specifically. When was the issue discussed with your board member, Peter Thiel? Uh, Congresswoman, I don't, I don't know that often. You don't know. This was the largest data scandal with respect to your company that had catastrophic impacts on the 2016 election. You don't, you don't know. Well, Congresswoman, I'm sure we we discussed it after it, uh, after after we were, were aware of what happened. Okay. Um, you announced recently that the official policy of Facebook now allows politicians to pay to spread disinformation. Um, in 2020 elections and in the future. So I just want to know how far I can push this um, in the next year. Under your policy, you know, using census data as well, could I pay to target predominantly black zip codes and advertise them the incorrect election date? But you said you're not going to fact check my no, we, ads. We have, if, if, uh, if anyone, including a politician, is saying things that uh, can cause, that is calling for violence or uh, could risk imminent physical harm or voter or census suppression mm -hmm. when we roll out the census suppression policy, um, we will take that content down. So, so you will, there is some threshold where you will fact check political advertisements. Is that what you're telling me? Well, Congresswoman, yes, in, for specific things like that, where there's imminent risk of harm. Could I role. run ads targeting Republicans in primaries saying that they voted for the Green New Deal? Sorry, I, I, can you repeat that? Would I be able to run advertisements on Facebook targeting Republicans in primary saying that they voted for the Green New Deal? I mean, if you're not fact-checking political advertisements, I'm just trying to understand the, the bounds here. What's fair game? Congresswoman, I, uh, I don't know the answer to that off the top of my head. I think So probably. you don't know if I'll be able to do that? I think probably. Um, do you see a potential problem here with a complete lack of fact-checking on political advertisements? Well, Congresswoman, I think lying is bad, and I think if you were to run an ad that had a lie, that would be bad. That's different from it being, uh, from it, from, for in our position, the right thing to do to prevent uh, your constituents or people in an election from seeing that you had lied. Um, so we can, so you won't take down lies, or you will take down lies. I think it's just a pretty simple yes or no. Congresswoman. Uh, in, I'm not talking about spin. I'm talking about actual in, Yes, in most cases, in a democracy, okay. I believe that people should be able to see for themselves what politicians that they may or may not vote for so are you saying won't take to judge them their down. character for themselves. So you won't take You may flag that it's wrong, but you won't take it down. Uh, Congresswoman, it's, uh, it, it depends on the context that it shows up. Organic post adds okay. the, the treatment is a little One different. question, one more question. In your ongoing dinner parties with far-right figures, some of who advanced the conspiracy theory that white supremacy is a hoax, did you discuss so-called social media bias against conservatives, and do you believe there is a bias? Uh, Congresswoman, um, so I don't remember everything that was in the, send in, in the question. That's all right. I'll move on. Can you explain why you've named The Daily Caller, a publication uh, well-documented with ties to white supremacists as an official fact checker for Facebook? Congresswoman, sure. We actually don't appoint the independent fact checkers. They go through an independent organization called the Independent Fact Checking Network that has a rigorous standard for who they allow to, uh, to serve as a fact checker. So you would say that white supremacist tied uh, publications meet a rigorous standard for fact checking? Thank you. Uh, Congresswoman, I would say that we're not the one assessing 
that, that standard, the international fact-checking network is the one who is setting that standard. Thank you. The gentlewoman from Virginia, Ms. Wixton, is recognized. The gentlewoman for five from New York, Ms. Ocasio Cortez, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for coming today. Secretary Carson, it's good to see you again. Um, Secretary Mnuchin, releasing Fannie and Freddie from conservatorship is one of your top priorities, correct? I would say housing reform is one of my top priorities. And again, we have not predetermined whether they go through conservatorship or receivership. Okay, I see here um, from a Washington Post article, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac should be privatized, Secretary of the Treasury nominee says. And it says here that you stated privatizing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac is, quote, right up there on the top 10 list of things we're going to get done. Do you recall that? I do. That's accurate. So again, I was just referring to, pri I, we do believe they belong in the private sector. That could be through conservatorship or through, as I said, other resolution mechanisms. I, see. I understand. Uh, are you aware that the same day you made those comments, um, Fannie Mae's share price increased by 46 percent and Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac's uh, share prices jumped 43 percent? I was, and I think it was clear the market didn't understand my comments and, and what they implied. I see. Many times there's very little liquidity and markets are not efficient. I see. Um, just to clarify for the record and for the confidence of, of the American people, um, Mr. Mnuchin, have you, your spouse, or any beneficiary of your assets, including your 15 disclosed trusts, uh, would they stand to receive any financial gain from your plan surrounding the exit of Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac from conservatorship? Today, no. I, I, I have divested all my assets, and other than uh, it, no, I've divested all my assets. I have no reason to believe I have anything to gain. Mm -hmm. Was there any gain from the increase in that share price uh, in following those remarks? I'm not aware of it. Okay. Um, Director Calabria, you have also made clear your intentions to release Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac from conservatorship with or without congressional action um, to provide an explicit government guarantee. And you have already taken steps in that direction by allowing uh, the, GSC to, the GSCs to build capital. Um, there are serious concerns that if you proceed with this plan without Congress, there would be a serious loss of investor confidence, which could result in an unforeseeable disruption to the housing market. Have you heard from any of those concerns from domestic or global investors? Uh, Going back to concerns about disruption of the housing market, um, what are some of those disruptions that have been raised? Um, with the information you provide in your testimony, I'd like to discuss a matter of rent with you. In the 14th district of New York, an average renter earns about $20 an hour. Um, but they don't earn enough to afford a one-bedroom apartment um, at fair market rent. Families are looking for stability as household income, incomes can't keep up with the rising costs of rent. Um, first and foremost, I want to ask, for someone making about $45,000, what do you think is a fair rent for them to pay? I'm sorry, I just need to grab a number because I'm running out of time. You want a number of what I think somebody's rent should be? I think that ultimately should be between them and their Maybe about $45,000 a year? Uh, I think that it should ultimately, I don't think I should be deciding. You know anyone that makes forty five k and what kind of what their rent is? Uh, that's a little more higher income than, you know, somebody paying 45 income in rent. Are you saying 45 income, income or 45 No, if, if someone making $45,000 a year, what's a ballpark? So, let's say if you were a friend of mine and you were making forty five, what would I suggest you personally not do, as a government official, any? I would be happy to say that you probably shouldn't spend more than 15 grand tops on your rent. Thank you very much. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. I recognize you. Uh, you for your service. Representative Ocasio-Cortez for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I would like to thank my colleague Ayanna Presley and Mr. DeSaulnier for, um, for your work also in organizing this hearing and a critically important issue at this time. Um, Ms. Bueso and Mr. Sanchez, I want to thank you both for coming to testify. I would like to thank all of our witnesses for coming to testify before this committee. Um, it is an enormous, it is enormously taxing physically, emotionally, mentally 
to come here and to testify before this committee and to prepare for your testimony, no less to, to, to testify for the length at which you all are doing. So I'd like to thank you. I'd like to recognize that you're doing it not just out of self-preservation, but to make sure that thousands of children and other people in the United States are protected. Um, I'd also like to apologize to you both for the behavior of some of the members of this committee, where they are speaking in profoundly dehumanizing terms to you, and you don't deserve that. I'd like to apologize to you on behalf of the United States of America for the dehumanizing policies that they are pursuing to, that are frankly targeting you and targeting many people in the United States. And we're fighting for a better country that we can be proud of when it comes to how we treat all people and understanding the circumstances that they are coming from. And I'd also like to recognize the intrinsic value that you have and offer to everybody that you encounter in our country. Speaking of which, um, Ms. Bueso, uh, do you remember in long time ago, um, and you may not, but uh, in 2003, um, participating in a clinical trial for MPS 6 in Oakland, California? I was really young, I was mm -hmm. seven, but I do remember coming here with my mom and being participating in a clinical trial. You, you were seven years old? Yeah, seven or eight, yeah, do you remember, in 2003. Do you remember, and again, I know you were very young, but do you remember a girl named Marielle Abreu? She's from New York. She's from New York. Yeah. She's a constituent of mine. And she wants to write and submit to the congressional record a letter of support for you to stay in the United States. So, Mr. Chairman, I would like to seek unanimous consent to offer this letter to the congressional record. Without objection, the letter will be entered. And clearly, you had a profound impact on her. Yeah. And I think it's a testimony to your character and uh, just who you are as a person. That being said, um, uh, Ms. Uh, Professor Wadia, direct and deferred action, rather, ensures that children can stay in the United States to receive treatment for life-threatening medical conditions without fear of being deported, correct? And the deferred action is subject to very strict internal controls. You have reviewed hundreds of these actions, of these cases, and the reasons for granting deferred action are generally limited to very serious life and death issues. Isn't that correct? Correct. So, folks and people like Mr. Sanchez and Ms. Bueso are not collateral damage to this administration's policy. They are the target, correct? Correct. Is targeting, or is targeting and, and changing policy to specifically target people with life-threatening diseases for deportation, essentially killing them through deportation, would you characterize that as cruel? I would. This is a cruel policy change, and this fits a pattern that we have been seeing over and over again before this committee of a culture and a policies specifically almost animated by cruelty. We hear over and over again, and we've heard it today from folks across this committee, that they're under-resourced, that we have to continue dumping billions of dollars into enforcement, into putting children in cages, into, into a system that is quite literally killing people. But meanwhile, we are adding to the resource strains by forcing people to go through the ordeal, forcing this country to, for, through the ordeal of needlessly deporting people like Ms. Bueso and Mr. Sanchez. Of course you're under-resourced because, under-resourced for your goals because your goals is to deport people that have no reason human, on humanitarian grounds or otherwise to be deported. Would you agree with that, Ms. Dr. Wadia? Is that a, a, an assessment? That, is that how this strikes you? Uh, the witness may answer the question. Uh, it, it does, and it goes to my testimony about how we spend resources. Uh, this 
change in policy also throws a wrench into the rule of law uh, because of the fact that discretion is such a necessary component and part of the rule of law. We have to make choices about who we're going to target for removal and who we're going to place. And when we want to talk okay. about morale. Uh, the, the gentleman's time has expired now.